Well, Jamie, thank you so much for joining me here today. And we're going to talk about your football career here in just a moment. But I know that before that, you actually played soccer and worked in professional soccer. So I want to take you back to college, if we could start there. And you played on two national championship teams as a player at Clemson. Uh, so just kind of uh, revisit that and reflect on something that stood out about those championship teams when you were there in college at Clemson. Yeah, it, it was it was a great it's been a great ride overall, right? Uh, and it, it really started for me in college and and having the opportunity to go to Clemson and was one of the top programs in the country at the time and remains a really solid uh, soccer program. We won my uh, freshman year and my and my senior year, and uh, I, I can't say that either time we had the best talent in the country, but we had a a group of guys that loved each other, fought hard for each other. We had a wonderful locker room. And uh, uh, really, the, uh, that camaraderie is what I think allowed us to elevate over certain teams that uh, may have been more talented. I know you spent some time at UCLA, and they were on our list at my senior year. We had to go out there to uh, play them. Uh, uh, well, actually, that was my freshman year. We had to go out and play them to, to, to earn a chance to play in the championship. So anyway, it was just really a special time. And, and so many things that you learn from those experiences, both in terms of, of being a great teammate and being a, you know, being a leader. Yeah. And I think one of those teams, you guys were kind of the last seed into the tournament and kind of had to overcome a lot of strong teams. Uh, was there anything about that group of individuals or that culture that you guys had in Clemson soccer overall that just made it uh, kind of a natural thing to overcome adversity like that? Well, the core of the team had been together for um, for the you know the entire four years, you know. So uh, that that was that was helpful. That you had you know, really experienced guys that had tight bonds between them. And you're right, we were the last team selected for the NCAA tournament. Uh, we had to go on the road and beat uh, uh, beat uh, Evansville at Evansville, Indiana. At Indiana, they never lost at home in the playoffs. Uh, Rutgers, and then we were fortunate to be able to come back to Clemson and play the semifinals and the and the finals. So, um, yeah, I think I think it had to do with the you know core guys cared deeply about each other and some and and a few uh, rookies that uh, came in and, and and made an impact. So again, it was not the eleven best players in the country, but the uh, the best eleven uh, at least for that that run of games. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we see this a lot in pro sports as well, right? It's not right. always the guys with the best combine times or the most talented teams that end up winning. And I think from here you transitioned and you had some work in corporate America before you got into professional sports uh, in which you were working with the Columbus crew, uh, the new MLS franchise. So just kind of talk about that transition of taking that business experience and taking that into pro soccer and learning to be a a uh, professional sports team executive for the first time. Yeah, and then uh, kind of like you, I think when you when you left college, you were kind of like, okay, what's next? I mean, all you'd ever wanted to do was uh, was be an athlete, right? And uh, I had that same uh, that same situation, and so I just took a job at IBM because people told me it was the best job that I, you know, that was available at Clemson for for a business graduate, and uh, it was a great experience. I learned a ton. Um, it was uh, it was you know selling was the, the focus. And so the time that I was there, I was a large account salesperson who went through their extensive sales uh, training. And, you know, that, that's really been invaluable because whether you're selling products or selling ideas, people are selling all day long, selling your concepts, selling your way. And uh, so that, that IBM way of selling was really helpful. But I knew after a few years that it wasn't my destiny. So uh, I went back to graduate school and uh, coached at Indiana University uh, in soccer and got an MBA, and at the end decided, you know, I really want to be in a sports business, but I didn't have a job, right? So I went and uh, worked for the World Cup in uh, Chicago in 1994, and helped to put that that venue together and put on put on those games, but still didn't have anything. So I wound up going to Procter and Gamble, uh, but kept those relationships that I built. And I would tell you, it's just that's if you want to get into any profession, the uh, the informational interviews that you can do. Um, you know, when people don't think you're coming to get a job, you can at least build a relationship. And one of those relationships is what got me in the door with uh, Lamar Hunt's organization and the Columbus crew. And so that was a great experience. Spent five years building that team and 
um, from the ground up, you know, from the first employee to building a stadium and building a training facility. And then a recruiter called me after we opened a crew stadium, which was the first of the soccer specific stadiums in the U S um, and asked me if I'd ever wanted to be in the national football league. And, and so from there um, led the startup of the business of the Houston Texans, and then went on to be uh, president over a 20 year period. Yeah, and you're hitting on something I'm really passionate about, which is the informational interview and, and building relationships. Talk about that just real briefly, kind of, you know, your mentality going in there. And I know, you know, this is a while back, but um, just kind of the benefit of having the ability to get in front of really smart people and learn from them. Just kind of talk about your mentality back then. And I'm, I'm sure you still do quite a bit of this as well today. Well, I, you know, relationships make everything work, right? And so, um, um, you, you know, having an ability to connect with people and have people believe in you and want to see you be successful, you know, I, I eventually we'll be talking about mentors. I mean, I mean, that's that's really the key is is someone seeing something in you that they want to help bring out. So you've got to do your part. You know, you got to you got to lean into it. And you got to work hard. You got to show you're committed. And then uh, it's amazing what people will do for you. Yeah, yeah, no question. And, um, you know, obviously, it led you to working with the Columbus crew. And then that indirectly kind of led you into working in professional football in it's interesting, you just mentioned kind of the startup environment uh, of an NFL team. Uh, take us back there. And I want to just kind of start with your time beginning at the Texans and really kind of around the biggest challenge in creating an identity as a new NFL franchise. Yeah. Well, uh, the, uh, first of all, you know, I had the benefit of, of, you know, leading one startup already. And so I made lots of mistakes and swore I'd never do that again. Right. So, um, but, but had a 30 month plan to launch the team and, you know, some of the key pieces of that was, you know, building the revenue streams, the uh, tickets and suites and sponsors and naming rights to the, to the stadium. And, so that all went incredibly well. The building the identity of the team, we did a ton of focus group interviews um, across the state of Texas to try to get a feel for what people would expect from their NFL team. And things like pride and courage and strength and tradition and independence and authenticity, those words kept popping up. And so I uh, worked with uh, you know, a couple of great designers trying to find something that would you know, and, and we knew the name needed to be Texans. We were like, that, that's exactly what, you know, that you, you come to Texas, as you know, and uh, every advertisement is about the pride of being a Texan. And so uh, yes. that, that was a fairly easy decision. The harder one was, how do you represent Texan? You know, if you're the stallions, it's really easy. It's going to be a horse, right? And, uh, and you go from there. But uh, we stumbled upon this idea of the bull, the spirit of the bull which is, you know, synonymous with the spirit of Texas and the, and the logo, uh, you know, was kind of shaped like the, or, or formatted like the uh, state of Texas flag. So that gives some meaning to it. And then the, the star, uh, which is in the flag and in the logo, it, each of the points is one of those words that I mentioned earlier. It, it, it's about pride, courage, strength, tradition, and independence, you know, each one of those points on the star. So Anyway, um, that, that's how the identity came about. And when we showed it for the first time, people went crazy. I mean, we were doing six months of uh, focus groups looking at different uh, logos. And that was the first time anybody had anything positive to say. And we just were off to the races. That's great. And as a fellow Texan, I can definitely identify with the fact that that is really important. We're all about identifying as Texans and the independence uh, and everything, the pride, especially that you just mentioned. Uh, and I know at your time there, um, you know, you, you eventually became the president of the team. Uh, mm -hmm. And I've heard you talk before, and you mentioned it in your book about elevating to leading leaders uh, right. and kind of the difference between being in the business and kind of running the business. So kind of talk about that transition to managing people by remote control and kind of uh, the evolution of your role while you were with Houston. Yeah, I, early on, uh, you know, and, and, and out of necessity in a startup environment, you're, you're very hands on, right? But at some point in time, I, I realized based on a 360 degree feedback that was done, beknownst to me, 
that it, it was, it was, we were at a point where that I needed to elevate myself because I couldn't work in the business and work on the business. There were things that were necessary for me to own. And if I'm in, you know, doing my staff's job all day long, I don't have the time to be able to do that. And so um, began to, you know, think about what, what that role is like, you know, I mean, and, and you have to, you have to manage up, you know, so that you uh, inspire confidence uh, in the people that you work for, manage down. So trying to deliver clarity. And so that's where I'm uh, working in the business is just not to do the things, but to make it really clear who we are and what we're here to get accomplished and hold people accountable. And, uh, and that's, you know, that, that's where managing by remote control uh, uh, comes in, that you, you, you set the expectations, what the outcomes are supposed to be, not the how, you know, let, let people decide how they're gonna do it, but be real clear on where you want them to be at the end of the period, uh, give them support, give them resources, be there for them, but that's the extent of it. So then they can go and, and, and do the day-to-day -day work to, to, you know, to realize the vision that's been established for them. And then managing outside of the organization is important. I needed to be the face of the team and the business community. And so spending time doing that, and you want, you want people to respect you, re respect that you're, you're a capable executive and that you're, uh, uh, that you're operating with the best interest of the community in mind, in addition to your own business. And then leading across, you know, becoming a great teammate, you know, the, the kind of person that when, when, uh, when, when challenges are there, you're the first name on the list that people want you to come in and help them to, to, to resolve those. So uh, that, I, hope, I think that kind of covers that idea of, you know, because you, if you, if you want to have slow and steady progress, you, you lead followers, right? But if you want exponential growth, if you want greatness, you got to lead leaders, right? And, and leading leaders um, is, you know, was our hallmark for, for the 20 years. Yeah, and just having the ability to replicate yourself and, and obviously the values that you guys were instilling within the organization. And we're going to get to building culture here in just a second. But, uh, you know, I want to uh, ask you, uh, you worked obviously closely with Bob McNair, who was the owner of the Texans. Um, and I just want to hear from you. I've, I've heard you talk before about him modeling the behavior. Uh, mm -hmm. about what was expected and, and maybe kind of building that culture um, in an unspoken way. So just kind of talk about what you learned from him in terms of leading an organization. Yeah, well, Don, Don Shula said it, said it best. I know, I know of no other way to lead than by example. And so with the, at, at the top ownership, myself, that you, you're, you're constantly delivering messages with everything you do, everything you say, how you conduct yourself as to what the standard is. And, and Bob did a great job in that regard. And my job was to follow his lead in that others would follow my lead. You know, he wasn't there uh, all day long. That was my job to be, you know, the, the, the lead executive from a business perspective. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's just modeling the behaviors that you're looking for in everything, when you, everything you do communicates. You're, you're on stage, everybody's looking at you all day long. And so, the, which is, you know, a great responsibility, but also a great ability to influence, influence behaviors. Um, and, you know, that's really at the core of, uh, of building culture is you want the values to drive behaviors and the consistency between the two. Yeah, I, I really like how you outlined it in your book as well. Um, I had a personal experience. I was coaching at SMU who had a long history of, of losing and uh, had a new uh, coaching <clears throat> regime that had come in that I was fortunate enough to be one of the few holdovers from the previous staff. And I was able to watch them build that new culture that that ended up leading to us winning games and going to bowl games and having uh, a winning season and kind of almost re-identifying as a program for SMU. And the things that uh, Frank Gann Sr. in particular coached and kind of uh, created within our culture are the exact same things that you outlined in terms of the expectations, what the habits need to be, um, and then checking and testing those, right? Confirming right. validity uh, that that's what we want, and 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 this is what the uh, this is what we need to get the result uh, that we want. Uh, so, just kind of uh, share uh, in terms of building that culture. Was this something that you guys had like sat down, or that you had brought with you from Columbus, or, or was this kind of 
of a, a collection of people working to build this culture all at once. Yeah, so the, the, the culture that emerged um, was, was from our leadership team, you know, talking about, you know, how, how, how we want to operate. And one of the key things we did was we uh, uh, look, looked at the people in our organization that were successful and the kinds that we wanted to replicate and stuff. What are some of the things, the habits that they have that separate them from others? And we encapsulated it, tried to keep it really simple, uh, encapsulated it in one word, impact. We want people that want to go and make a difference. And that the I is about innovation, you know, that get better mentality, always looking for new and better ways to do what we do. M is about memorable. You know, they want to be remembered for something. They want to come in and make a difference. And they also enjoy creating memories for others. P is about passion, being passionate about their work, about the organization, um, about our fans and our community, being accountable, um, being courageous, and you know, courage is best defined as uh, do what's right and accept the consequences. And so, just trying to do what's right every day, um, we don't always, we didn't always get it right, but uh, rewarding the act of having the courage to do what was right in every situation. And then T is about team players. They're only team victories. There's individual victories count in the grand scheme, but we can only get where we're going together. You know, everybody's got to be operating at their best and, and everybody's got to collaborate and help each other. There can't be silos. We all have to have, we have to all have to share an objective for the organization and do whatever it takes to make that a reality. Yeah. And what were some of the things that you guys did to, to create that team mentality? Uh, I mean, I've seen it on the successful teams that I've been on. It's all been about the team and coming through for the uh, individual next to you. What were some things that you guys did while in Houston to kind of build that team mentality up? Well, one of the, one of the key things we did was, uh, well, the, the, it starts with the leadership team, right? So the leadership team have to be great collaborators. And so we had a very formalized process of getting together on a very regular basis to talk about everything that's going on, to you know, identify the gaps, to find ways for people to work together more closely. I had to, you know, it was incumbent upon me to, uh, to have that as a leading expectation you know, that idea of trust, we're going to trust each other, we're going to collaborate well, we're going to share, we're going to, we're, we're just, we're, we're going to all be great teammates. And uh, there's a great saying that uh, people need to be reminded much more than they need to be instructed, right? So as a leader, over communicating the expectation that we will be collaborative, um, and that we will, we will trust each other at, at that level. And then that trickles down throughout the organization. Maybe one of the key things we did, we, and, and we brought the staff together on a, on a fairly regular basis, which in some organizations happens, in some organizations it doesn't happen, and ours it did. And uh, you know, every, every time we're doing that, we're recognizing people for the, their, their impact behaviors, right? And it comes from stories that come from teammates, come from fans, come from people in the community, uh, customers, et cetera. And so, yeah, there was a small monetary reward associated with that, but more importantly, the opportunity to tell the story of what this person did. Stories sell, stories inspire. And so and stories uh, remind people you know, of what we're looking for uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it's just, it's not rocket science. It's just more the discipline to do it on a very regular basis. Uh, you know, Because as once you're totally sick of talking about it, people are just starting to get it. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you mentioned meeting. Uh, this is something that maybe uh, people that haven't worked in professional sports or particularly professional football may not understand is that those teams typically are meeting all the time uh, on a daily basis, if not multiple times a day. And I totally agree with you. The communication is such a big factor. Uh, we used to talk all the time about constant repetitive statements and I know you're real big on acronyms and, right. and kind of uh, putting all of those things to memory. Um, and the collaboration part is so key when we're talking about building a winning culture and bringing a team together. Talk about the importance of relationships, um, I guess, specifically within that organization. Um, obviously, you guys were meeting all the time. You guys were kind of uh, putting that message from the leadership team uh, and ma making sure it was trickling down. But just talk about the importance of relationships in all of this uh, in terms of building a winning organization. Well, I'd go one layer below relationships because relationships are founded on trust, and you uh, you can't have a relationship without without trust. 
right? And so, uh, it, and it's the way that you conduct yourself. I mean, you have to consciously prioritize the relationship, you know, because the business issue, those will come and go, but you have to handle each one of those in a manner that keeps the relationship intact to the extent you can, you know, and you usually yeah. can. So uh, I, I would say that, you know, the, the building the trust, um, you know, demanding that people trust each other. Um, and when you identify that things are broken down to address those and, and uh, over time, if people don't get it, then, you know, sometimes um, if you can't change the people, you have to change the people. Yes. And, uh, you know, actually that, that kind of leads me in. I wanted to talk about the talent acquisition piece. Uh, and I know you talk in your book about kind of having the ability to hire the right type of people. And uh, something I'm really passionate about is finding the intangibles, whether we're talking about players or just about individuals that you're hiring, uh, maybe outside the lines of football. Uh, so I, I want to give you an opportunity. You've talked about work ethic and positive attitude, I know is really big with you. Um, talk about some of the intangibles that you're looking for. And I'd love to hear maybe one or two things that that you kind of use to either ask questions in the interview process, or maybe that you're doing research to find this out about people? Well, I, you know, I, I didn't do, I didn't wind up doing a lot of interviews, but I did do a lot of interviews. I would be the last interview. And so the expectation on the hiring managers is, hey, uh, you, you need the technical competency. I get that. But you also need to test them for winning attitude uh, <clears throat> and a strong work ethic right? Make it really clear. I mean, we work really hard here. Everybody's positive, optimistic, team oriented. Um, and then, you know, make sure they're clear on the values of the organization, particularly this idea of impact, that this is what you're going to be. So being really clear up front, <clears throat> you try to get a sense for, you know, based on somebody's background, if, if, they, if they fit in those regards. And then when I would sit with them, as I would reinforce that. <clears throat> and you know, make it really clear that it, it, you know, this isn't going to be a cakewalk. This, you're not going to be hanging around with the football players. This is hard work. It's serious. We've got a lot of very talented, committed people that, uh, that are working to make a difference. And if that's the kind of place you want to be, it'll work out well. I, I only had one time where somebody called back afterwards after visiting with me and said, you know what, this sounds like too much work. I, uh, I, I don't want to do it. So it, it's, it's a two-way street, right? We, we have to, they, the candidate's got to be real clear on who they are. And we've got to be real clear on at, about who we are. And then if there's a fit, that's great. But if not, then we'll move on to the next candidate. Yeah, I love uh, David Shaw has used in recruiting when talking about the players that he's going to recruit. He talks about starting as you mean to go on. And there's nothing wrong with being honest about how difficult it's going to be and the hard work that's going to be involved and somebody saying no, um, uh, rather than, you know, maybe trying to, to, to put a front on it. So uh, right. I 100% agree with that. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, eventually it doesn't work out anyway. I mean, you got to be, you have to be open and honest and clear about what the expectations are going to be. And, uh, and you know, it, it's the right place for the right people. Correct, correct. And uh, something else I've heard you talk about is the importance of admitting mistakes. And this can be tough uh, in kind of a, a very ego driven world like professional sports, uh, you know, just to kind of take that step back and number one, recognize that maybe things aren't going right. And maybe it had to do with a decision that a leader made. Um, but I, I want to know from your perspective, you know, you've had all of this experience being at the highest levels of sport. What are some things that leaders can do to get comfortable admitting their mistakes and knowing that that will create trust within the organization like you were just speaking about? Yeah, I think it's the it's the uh, it's the leader that sets the stage for uh, people's behaviors as it relates to admitting mistakes or trying to cover things up. And you have to you have to create a safe environment to talk about what happened, right? And with, with no retribution, eventually if people make the same mistakes over and over, you have to make, make a change. But if you can make a, make a mistake, learn from it and not do that again, that's great. But the leaders want us has to say that, you know, we're, we're, all, we're all gonna be open and honest that one of the powerful tools we used is from the US Army, the after action review process to, to you know, sit down and say, okay, what happened? Uh, what, 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 was the, what was the outcome expected? Uh, what really happened? 
and why and how do we go about uh, fixing the things that were wrong. And if, it, if it's procedural, it, it, it feels, people will feel more comfortable saying, you know what, this didn't, this didn't go right. Uh, I could have done better here. Here's what I'll do next time. And, you know, early on, as we were doing those, I would, I would start with, hey, look, we're, we're not here to fix the blame. We're here to fix the problems. And if we, fi if we fix the problems, we'll get better because it's not about being perfect. Perfect, perfect is impossible, but getting better and excellence is. Talk about that for a second in terms of the after action review, because this is something that uh, I've I've read about and am very intrigued by. How did you guys utilize that in Houston? Was this in the form of like a written report? Uh, was it kind of like a, a presentation to a leadership group of a certain department? How did you guys utilize that after action review concept from the military? Well, it was for big initiatives that we had. And when the initiative is over, we would gather the team together. Uh, spend whatever amount of time that it takes to, to go through and get everybody's thoughts on, you know, what we did well, what we didn't do well, what we're going to do differently uh, next time when, because, you know, a lot of the things we do are annual activities, right? And so they can always be improved and get better. And then someone's responsible for summarizing that and making sure that it's available to us, to us when we get ready to do it for the next time so that we remember here's here's what we said we wanted to do better and hold ourselves accountable for growing in that regard can you is there anything that stands out that maybe you guys talked about after a success or a failure that you were able to change do, do any examples come to mind it, it's, it's usually it's usually a lot of small things you know it's fine-tuning details and um, and then you know uh, we had another process between seasons to sit down and say okay what are our fans telling us about the experience you know what what's broken how do we need to get better and what what capital investments are required what do we have to do from a personnel perspective what do we need to do from a process perspective and then we spend the off season periodically gathering those teams together to make those improvements and then implement them for the season it's you know what, once it becomes a good process and you have good people, you wind up getting good results. Yeah, no, no question. Um, and, and you're kind of hitting on a lot of the things that you talked about earlier in terms of building the culture, right? It's kind of all built into your processes, much like you, you said before, right? The values are uh, reflected in the habits. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I really love that. Uh, and, and, you know, you were around so many great players while you were in Houston. Um, yeah, Andre Johnson and J.J. Watt and DeAndre Hopkins and Dwayne Brown, just name a few. We could go on and on. But I just want to know, were there any type of characteristics about any of those individuals that maybe stand out to you or maybe commonalities that you saw in all those special players? Yeah, well, I, I'll tell you, the, uh, the two that were particularly special uh, to be involved with were uh, uh, Andre Johnson and J.J. Watt, okay? And the, the thing, I, you know, I refer to them as triple threats, right? So they have rare God-given talent. They, uh, they work their tails off, and they recognize an opportunity and obligation to give back to the community that you usually don't get all three of those in one player. And so that's why those guys are so special to me. And that I, I totally agree with you um, in terms of hitting on all three. And, you know, quite honestly, it, it doesn't always happen where you're going to hit on those, all, all three of those. Talk about the character aspect. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, I've heard this before about both Andre Johnson and J.J. Watt. Just talk about the character and kind of like what you guys were looking for in terms of uh, your team leaders and kind of like the, the character that each of them brought to the team. Yeah, well, they, they, they both were high character guys and uh, were reflected in, in them being great teammates and, uh, and and being hard workers and, and taking their craft seriously. You know, it, it was important to them. And that rubs off on everybody in the locker room, right? If, uh, if the leader is working his tail off um, and somebody that you respect that much, you know, that, that, that lifts you, you know, if he can do it, I can do it. Yeah. And, and how did they each handle success? Because those are two all, all pro performers. Talk about how each of them handled their success. Yeah. Well, I think they, uh, yeah, they, to the extent you can, as a professional athlete, they stayed humble, Right. Uh, they stayed focused on their, um, you know, on, on what made them successful, their success habits. 
and and part of that is you know layered with with hard work, right? And they um, they uh, they kept going. They kept challenging themselves. You know, good enough never is for them. What what's the next level? And uh, yeah, so I think I think those those are the things that allowed them to have sustained success over a long period of time. Yeah, it's so special when you get really good players like that, but then the added bonus when they are leaders in the locker room, and it doesn't have to be rah rah uh, charismatic right. leadership. It's it's kind of what you outlined at the beginning, where it's you know leadership is leading by example and, and showing everybody the way. Uh, and, and you know, regardless whether they just signed a big contract extension or just got named to the All Pro team, they show up and they're all about that work all the time. Yeah, well, it's interesting because you, you you hit hit the nail on the head as it relates to to JJ and to Andre. It couldn't be two different personalities. You had JJ that was you know a very energized, vocal leader, and yet Andre that hardly spoke at all, and he just led by example. Yeah, real really special, and I know that those individuals have a cascading effect when we're talking about building a culture and maintaining a culture, obviously. Um, and I want to turn to you for a second, because uh, I've heard you talk a lot about the get better mindset. And, uh, you know, you, you had this incredibly successful run. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, anytime you can be at a uh, college or professional organization for more than four or five years, that is kind of an anomaly. Uh, here you are, a two-decade run with a professional team. Um, but, but yet, despite all of that, in terms of the get better mindset, where do you still want to grow as a leader? Yeah. Well, um, right now, I'm kind of figuring out what, what is next for me. What are the things that I love to do at, at this point in, in my career? And, I, and, I'm, and I, th I think it's a, a team environment again, probably going into something that, uh, that, that needs to be um, need, needs to be taken to a new level, right? So I've done two startups. Uh, it, it's still a builder kind of exercise, right? That uh, to, to go in and figure out what's working and what's not, and 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 try to take it to the same, take it to take it to the next level, and uh, do it with a different group of people. You know, I uh, I love all the folks that are at the Texans, but uh, you know that that chapter's closed, and and I'll be opening a new one, and so uh, stay tuned. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for the run of success that you had, um, you know, obviously in pro sports, uh, it's, it's not always that you get a, a sustained run of success like that. I've been doing a lot of reading on Theo Epstein and, you know, he's very honest about, I'm really good at building, uh, you know, franchises or building cultures, but I'm not so great at maintaining them. So to have the ability to do both is, is obviously special. So uh, looking forward to seeing uh, what is next uh, for you, Jamie. Um, and a couple of other things I want to hit on before we wrap up. Uh, I've heard you talk about your meticulous note taking. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I am a huge note taker as well. And so I was wondering if you could just, this is maybe more for me than the audience, but uh, just enlighten us on some of your note taking habits and, and uh, how that's influenced and impacted your leadership over the years. Yeah, I, uh, I, I just... Um have always believed that to have a, a pencil in your hand and to be writing even more so than, than typing, it, it, it drives the message that you're, you want to, you want to remain with you real very much more deep into your, into your mind. Even if you don't go back and review the notes again, which most times I don't, but it allows me to retain much more. I mean, that's, that's why the habit developed and uh, it's just something I've never walked away from. Very cool. Yes. Uh, when I started my coaching career, I started taking notes and those are, you know, still notes that I refer back to this day. So a hundred percent agree with you. And, you know, we talked about kind of some of the people that had influence in terms of players. Uh, but I want to hear from you in terms of just some of the people uh, in relationships that were really important to you in terms of your development, uh, either as mentors or maybe just people that you could turn to professionally. And so just want to hear, like, who are the people that influenced you and, and what is some of the advice that maybe they've given you over the years that has stuck with you? Yeah, so there were, there were three key influences, you know, starting at Indiana with uh, Jerry Yagley, who started the IU soccer program and is just a wonderful leader himself. Um, you know, one of the things I picked up from him is, you know, before games, he would gather the coaches and we'd talk about the starting lineup. 
And at the end, he'd always demand that, uh, hey, we had differing opinions here, but this lineup is our lineup, right? There's, there's no light, daylight between us. That always stuck with me that uh, as a leader in your leadership team, you got to give the, it's got to be an open environment where everybody can express their opinions, but eventually decisions are going to be made and everybody's got to support the decisions, regardless of how they felt on, uh, on the given issue. And then Lamar Hunt, um, he was very much a, a lead by example guy, uh, the founder of the American Football League, gave me an MBA in sport management during the five years that I was at the uh, Columbus, uh, Columbus crew. And then um, uh, Bob McNair was a tremendous uh, role model for me, not, not only from a business perspective, but, but how you conduct your life, you know, how do you, um, how do you become a, you know, a, a leader that somebody would follow, you know, a, 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 a child, a, a, a parent that a child would respect and a, and a husband that a wife would love, you know, what are the things that you need to do there? So it was more of a personal thing, but I, I learned a ton from a business wise. So uh, I don't think I can come up with one thing relative to, uh, relative to Bob. Yeah, of course. Probably not the not a great question to ask about all these influential people and uh, pick out one or two things. Um, but you know that leads directly into kind of uh, wanted to touch on your book, obviously, um, the winning game plan. And you talked about how uh, Bob McNair taught you so much, not only about football but about life and um, you know being a father. It sounds like and and the importance of relationships. And your book is very much the same, right? Like it's a leadership book, but it's not necessarily about sports. These are universal uh, lessons. So kind of talk about the evolution of this book and kind of like what caused you to, to write uh, this book after all these years with the Texans? You know, I, I've, I've always been a student of leadership. I've done tons of uh, keynote presentations on a variety of leadership philosophies that I've developed throughout my life. And I thought it was something that could help people, you know, accelerate their learning journey as a leader. You know, and if people take one or two things out of it and put it into their repertoire, That'd be a huge success. I also wanted it to be a fun read. So uh, hopefully the stories were somewhat entertaining. No, you've got some really good stories and you're kind of pulling from a bunch of different backgrounds that you have, which I think is really cool. Uh, and, and talk briefly on your unique approach, because I know you've talked about it before and you do have a, a kind of a unique background in terms of a, a pro sports uh, executive. You know, you had the, the sales world, uh, corporate world that you were involved in, and then uh, your MBA education, your soccer coaching, uh, just kind of talk about your un unique approach uh, that you've yeah. developed over the years. Well, it, it, it's just been kind of cobbled together, you know, things that I've learned, uh, different, um, you know, things that I've read, people that I've, that I've uh, admired, um, mentors that I've had, and I've just, it's just become a patchwork of, of beliefs, you know, and you mentioned about uh, the note taking, but then also, you know, the acronyms and quotes and all these things to keep at my ready disposal, these ideas that I think uh, deliver exceptional results on a consistent basis. So yeah, it's just kind of been, it's kind of Lego, you know, little Lego blocks together. And, and uh, you know, about a year ago, it felt like it was, uh, you know, a, a complete work and it was time to put it down on paper. Yeah, I love it. And I can relate to a lot of what you're saying just in terms of having, you know, the pro sports experience, but also experiencing some other things and how uh, some some worlds and environments might be completely different. But like you're saying, the, the traits um, and, and the leadership skills required to lead at the highest level uh, are universal and, and are definitely transferable. Uh, tell us, Jamie, where can we find this book and, and where can we get in touch with you or, or if you have a website or anything you want to yeah. refer us to? Yeah, so I'm, I'm on LinkedIn regularly, so you can, uh, you can catch me there. Uh, the book is available at Amazon.com. It's in uh, hardback, uh, paperback, and now uh, the audio book is out too, so, which is pretty cool. Um, and uh, my website is jamieroots.com. There's some tools there that uh, go along with the book. So uh, once you've read it, you can, can have some additional resources. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Well, I can tell you, uh, having read it myself, uh, highly recommend everybody check it out. Um, it, Jamie's book is called The Winning Game Plan. Um, and it's a great resource for becoming a better leader and leading an organization at the highest level. Jamie, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Coach. Good to be with you.